Hello, and welcome to the final report on January 6th, a reading. I am your host and narrator, Robert Keniston. This is episode 14. In this episode, we conclude President Trump's dereliction of duty during the now infamous 187 minutes. So, without further ado, let's continue. While some in the meeting invoked executive privilege, or failed to recall the specifics, others told us what happened at that point. Sarah Matthews, the White House Deputy Press Secretary, urged her boss, Kaylee McEnany, to have the president make a stronger statement. But she informed us that President Trump resisted using the word peaceful in his message. Committee staff, Ms. Matthews, Ms. McEnany told us she came right back to the press office after meeting with the president about this particular tweet. What did she tell you about what happened in that dining room? Sarah Matthews, when she got back, she told me that a tweet had been sent out, and I told her that I thought the tweet did not go far enough that I thought there needed to be a call to action and he needed to condemn the violence. And we were in a room full of people, but people weren't paying attention. And so she looked directly at me and in a hushed tone shared with me that the president didn't want to include any sort of mention of peace in that tweet and that it took some convincing on their part, those who were in the room. And she said that there was a back and forth over different phrases to find something he was comfortable with. And it wasn't until Ivanka Trump suggested the phrase stay peaceful that he finally agreed to include it at 3 13 p.m president trump sent another tweet but again declined to tell people to go home i am asking for everyone at the u.s capitol to remain peaceful no violence remember we are the party of law and order respect the law and our great men and women in blue thank you Almost everyone, including staff in the White House, also found the President's 2.38 p.m. and 3.13 p.m. tweets to be insufficient because they did not instruct the rioters to leave the Capitol. As mentioned, President Trump's son, Donald Trump Jr., texted Meadows. He's got to condemn this shit, ASAP. The Capitol Police tweet is not enough. Sean Hannity also texted Mark Meadows. Can he make a statement? I saw the tweet. Ask people to peacefully leave the Capitol. None of these efforts resulted in President Trump immediately issuing the message that was needed. White House staff had these comments. Pottinger. Yeah, it was insufficient. I think what, you can count me among those who was hoping to see an unequivocal strong statement clearing out the Capitol, telling people to stand down, leave, go home. I think that's what we were hoping for. Matthews. Yeah. So a conversation started in the press office after the president sent out those two tweets that I deemed were insufficient. I thought that we should condemn the violence and condemn it unequivocally. And I thought that he needed to include a call to action and tell these people to go home. And they were right. Evidence showed that neither of these tweets had any appreciable impact on the violent rioters. Unlike the video message tweet that did not come out until 4.17, finally instructing rioters to leave, neither the 2.38 nor the 3.13 tweets made any difference. At some point after 3.05 p.m. that afternoon, President Trump's chief of staff and President Trump himself were informed that someone had been shot. That person was Ashley Babbitt, who was fatally shot at 2.44 p.m., as she and other rioters try to gain access to the House chamber. There is no indication that this affected the president's state of mind that day, and we found no evidence that the president expressed any remorse that day. Meanwhile, leaders in Congress, including Speaker Pelosi, Senator Schumer, Senator McConnell, and the vice president, were taking action. They called the Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General, Governors and officials in Virginia, Maryland, and the District of Columbia begging for assistance. President-elect Biden also broadcast a video calling on President Trump to take action. I call on President Trump to go on national television now to fulfill his oath and defend the Constitution and demand an end to this siege. President Trump could have done this, of course, any time after he learned of the violence at the Capitol. 
at 4.17 p.m., 187 minutes after finishing his speech, and even longer after the attack began, President Trump finally broadcast a video message in which he asked those attacking the Capitol to leave. I know your pain. I know your hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us. It was a landslide election, and everyone knows it, especially the other side, but you have to go home now. We have to have peace. President Trump's Deputy Secretary, Sarah Matthews, testified about her reaction to this video message. He told the people who we had just watched storm our nation's capital with the intent of overthrowing our democracy, violently attack police officers, and chant heinous things like hang Mike Pence, we love you, you're very special. As a spokesperson for him, I knew that I would be asked to defend that. And to me, his refusal to act and call off the mob that day and his refusal to condemn the violence was indefensible. And so, I knew that I would be resigning that evening. By this time, the National Guard and other additional law enforcement had begun to arrive in force and started to turn the tide of the violence. Many of those attackers in the Capitol saw or received word of President Trump's 4.17 p.m. message, and they understood this message as an instruction to leave. Stephen Ayers testified in front of the select committee that, well, we were there. As soon as that came out, everybody started talking about it, and it seemed like it started to disperse, you know, some of the crowd. Obviously, you know, once we got back to the hotel room, we seen that it was still going on, but it definitely dispersed a lot of the crowd. Jacob Chansley, also known as the QAnon shaman, answered President Trump's directive. I'm here delivering the president's message. Donald Trump has asked everyone to go home. Another responded to Chansley, that's our order. Other unknown individuals also listened to President Trump's message while outside the Capitol and responded, He says, go home. He says, go home. And, yeah, here, he said to go home. At 6.01 p.m., President Trump sent his last tweet of the day, not condemning the violence, but instead attempting to justify it. These are the things and events that happen when a sacred election landslide victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. Go home with love and in peace. Remember this day forever. Staff in President Trump's own White House and campaign had a strong reaction to the message. Sarah Matthews. At that point, I had already made the decision to resign, and this tweet just further cemented my decision. I thought that January 6, 2021 was one of the darkest days in our nation's history, and President Trump was treating it as a celebratory occasion with that tweet. And so, it just further cemented my decision to resign. Tim Murtaugh, I don't think it's a patriotic act to attack the Capitol, but I have no idea how to characterize the people other than they trespassed, destroyed property, and assaulted the U.S. Capitol. I think calling them patriots is a, let's say, a stretch, to say the least. I don't think it's a patriotic act to attack the U.S. Capitol. Pat Cipollone, what happened at the Capitol cannot be justified in any form or fashion. It was wrong, and it was tragic, and a lot, and it was a terrible day. It was a terrible day for this country. Greg Jacob, I thought it was inappropriate. To my mind, it was a day that should live in infamy. At 6.27 p.m., President Trump retired to his residence for the night. As he did, he had one final comment to an employee who had accompanied him to the residence. The one takeaway that the president expressed in that moment, following a horrific afternoon of violence and the worst attack against the U.S. Capitol building in over two centuries, was this. Mike Pence let me down. President Trump's inner circle was still trying to delay the counting of electoral votes into the evening, even after the violence had been quelled. Rudolph Giuliani tried calling numerous members of Congress in the hour before the joint session resumed, including Representative Jim Jordan, Republican of Ohio, and Senators Marsha Blackburn, Republican of Tennessee, 
Tommy Tuberville, Republican of Alabama, Bill Hagerty, Republican of Tennessee, Lindsey Graham, Republican of South Carolina, Josh Hawley, Republican of Missouri, and Ted Cruz, Republican of Texas. His voicemail intended for Senator Tuberville at 7.02 p.m. that evening eventually was made public. Giuliani, Senator Tuberville, or should I say Coach Tuberville, this is Rudy Giuliani, the president's lawyer. I'm calling you because I want to discuss with you how they're trying to rush this hearing and how we need you, our Republican friends, to try to just slow it down so we can get these legislators to get more information to you. Reflecting on President Trump's conduct that day, Vice President Pence noted that President Trump had made no effort to contact me in the midst of the rioting or any point afterward. He wrote that President Trump's reckless words had endangered my family and all those serving at the Capitol. President Trump did not contact a single top national security official during the day, not at the Pentagon, nor at the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, the FBI, the Capitol Police Department, or the D.C. Mayor's Office. As Vice President Pence has confirmed, President Trump didn't even try to reach to his own vice president to make sure that Pence was safe. President Trump did not order any of his staff to facilitate a law enforcement response of any sort. His chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who is by statute the primary military advisor to the president, had this reaction. General Milley. You know, you're the commander-in-chief. You've got an assault going on at the capital of the United States of America. And there's nothing? No call? Nothing. Zero. General Milley did, however, receive a call from President Trump's Chief of Staff Mark Meadows that day. Here is how he described that call. He said, We have to kill the narrative that the Vice President is making all the decisions. We need to establish the narrative, you know, that the President is still in charge and that things are steady or stable, or words to that effect. I immediately interpret that as politics, 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 red flag for me personally, no action, but I remember it distinctly and I don't do political narratives. Some have suggested that President Trump gave an order to have 10,000 troops ready for January 6th. The select committee found no evidence of this. In fact, President Trump's acting security of defense Christopher Miller directly refuted this when he testified under oath. Committee staff. To be crystal clear, there was no direct order from President Trump to put 10,000 troops to be on the ready for January 6th, correct? Miller. No. Yeah, that's correct. There was no direct, there was no direct order from the president. Later, on the evening of January 6th, President Trump's former campaign manager, Brad Parscale, texted Katrina Pearson, one of the president's rally organizers, that the events of the day were the result of a sitting president asking for civil war, and that this week I feel guilty for helping him win, now that a woman is dead. Pearson answered, you do realize this was going to happen. Parscale replied, yeah, if I was Trump and knew my rhetoric killed someone, it wasn't the rhetoric, Pearson suggested, but Parscale insisted. Yes, it was. This podcast has been a production of 2008 Studios under a contract with sag after The recordings herein are property of 2008 LLC. Any inquiries to collaborate or contact can be sent to info at 2008.com. That's info at 20-08.com. If you enjoyed what you just heard, please feel free to share this podcast. And, of course, please subscribe to be updated on future episodes. Thank you for listening.